Hey guys, and welcome back to another video. This video is going to cover um, hypokalemia. So I've done a previous video a uh, day or two before this one on hyperkalemia. And we talked about the potassium shift, specifically uh, the pushing of potassium ions out of the cell and what kind of things cause that. Well, this video is going to dive into hypokalemia, uh, the definition, the symptoms, how it will present and kind of what causes it. And we'll get back into that potassium shift. But this time the potassium shift is going to cover this uh, the uptake of potassium into a cell so we'll cover some of those things and what causes that to happen But before we get into the video please like and subscribe this video um, it really helps my channel out and uh, we can jump right into this okay so we're gonna start off with the definition of hypokalemia so hypokalemia is a just means a decrease in the blood potassium level okay and you can have you're basically gonna have very similar symptoms uh, when you look at hyperkalemia, as far it relates to, as far as it relates to like the muscle weakness, uh, muscle problems, and then also cardiac arrhythmias, you can run into arrhythmic arith uh, problems, and then also entering into VFib if it becomes uh, severe enough, including brain problems and stuff like that. So here's the first thing: we know it causes muscle weakness because I said it presents similar to uh, hyperkalemia. It also causes problems with your heart, like uh, conduction, heart conduction issues. You need potassium for the efflux stage of repolarization part of an action potential. So we know that it can cause cardiac arrhythmias, whether it be hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. And then also it can affect uh, parts of the brain. And basically you need this for any sort of neural transmission across any part of the body. Okay, so let's move into now the focus of this video. Um, okay, sorry for a weird pause right there. I had to make sure I'd got my um, digital tablet working ready to go. So these are the primary things that are going to cause hypokalemia. Now some of these are related to the what's called the potassium shift. So that's going to actually cause potassium ions to be uptaken into a into cells. But some of these are just they're just a general rule that they would cause hypokalemia, and I feel like a lot of those are uh, fairly self-explanatory so let's get right into this so we're gonna go ahead and start and we're looking at the first one which is potassium channel blockers okay potassium channel blockers so potassium channel blockers is just as they're said so that's actually a class of antiarrhythmic medication that you study about in uh, the cardiovascular section of pharmacology and when you block basically it's blocking the potassium channel so if you have a cell here remember that we have the primary transporter which is the sodium potassium ATPase and that's going to send three sodium out and two potassium inside but actually this specific part this the potassium channel blockers is affecting these potassium channels where potassium can go just freely without the use of sodium or anything like that this is just a general potassium channel and these channels are used in the action potential portion to be absolutely to basically uh, make things happen so here's the action potential we know there's sodium influx at the depolarization stage and then in the repolarization st uh, stage when it's heading back to its resting membrane potential there's potassium efflux okay efflux meaning potassium leaves the cell so basically you will block this potassium efflux with potassium channel blockers and thus now potassium cannot exit the cell so you can imagine that that would decrease your potassium levels in the extracellular space so that's how potassium channel blockers work okay the next one is hyperaldosteronism so now I want you to remember that when you're talking about hyperaldosteronism this is kind of involved in the renin angiotensin so the renin uh, I just put A1 and A2 angiotensin so there's an angiotensin and angiotensin 2 and then that will eventually upregulate so if you had an increase of renin like in cases of low blood pressure that renin causes an increase in angiotensin 1 because of using the ACE enzyme in the lungs and then that will upregulate angiotensin 2 and then this angiotensin 2 will then increase aldosterone so I said all that to say that when you have an increase in aldosterone at the collecting duct and some of the distal tubule you're Aldos an increase in aldosterone causes increased sodium to come into uh, the cells and the space there inside the body, basically going out of the tubule. And it also causes another little cell specific to this area to uh, release potassium into the urine, basically, and then to be uh, urinated out. So it's sending, it's uptaking sodium. And remember, wherever sodium goes, water goes. So now we have an increase in blood pressure because of that, 
but it also causes this release of potassium into the tubule to then be peed out, okay? So that's hyperaldosteronism, and that's how you would lose uh, potassium in that situation. So those are pretty self-explanatory. For non-potassium sparing diuretics, so I want you to remember when you're learning about all the different diuretics, the only ones that are potassium sparing, meaning that you could actually build up potassium levels in the body, is going to be like the amylaride and the spironolactone uh, that both work at the collecting tubule, okay? So they working. So if you had a nephron, this is the proximal convoluted tubule, then you have the loop of Henle, then the distal convoluted tubule, and then this is the collecting duct. They're working over here, the potassium sparing. But we're talking about non-potassium sparing diuretics. That is all the other diuretics. So the diuretics like at the proximal tubule would be acetazolamide. The loop diuretic would be like furosemide, ethocrinic acid. The distal convoluted tubule would be thiazides. All of those, you actually lose potassium over time from using the diuretic. So that's another cause of hypokalemia. The next one is vomiting and diarrhea. That's pretty self-explanatory. There's potassium ions in your vomit and your diarrhea. So obviously that makes perfect sense. Um, if you have a diet lacking in potassium, this is supposed to be a K right here, diet lacking in potassium, that's common sense as well. Now we're getting into what I want to kind of more focus on, and these are the more of the ones that are involved with the potassium shift. So if we have a cell, uh, we're going to go, the first one is insulin. Do you remember I, in the other video on hyperkalemia, I said that this is the way I explained how hyperglycemia causes hyperkalemia. So let me show you. So if you have a ton of glucose in your blood, right, that's surrounding this cell, that means that there's less space in this extra, so this is the extracellular space, this is the intracellular space. So out here in the extracellular space, if you have a ton of glucose, that means you just have a ton of solutes in the blood. And that means that there's less space for water to be out here because each one of these glucose uh, solutes or particles takes up a given space in the extracellular space. So because there's a decrease in water out here and there's a ton of glucose solutes, that means that all of this water that's inside the cell that doesn't have as much glucose or solutes is going to want to come out to try to even out the amount of water and make it equal between the extracellular space and the intracellular space. When water leaves the cell, remember that potassium levels are highest inside a cell. Now there is some potassium outside in the extracellular space, but potassium levels are higher in the cell. When this water leaves out, okay, you're basically now concentrating the potassium ions. So now the potassium ions, even though the total amount has not changed, the actual total amount, the concentration of the potassium ions has, now all the potassium ions are closer to each other and they're more dense and focused to where if you were to close your eyes and reach into this cell, and pull something out, there's a greater chance that you would now grab a potassium ion versus if you tried to grab it within a cell that's also filled with the H2O molecule. So now that there's a higher concentration of potassium, the potassium also wants to leave out to try to balance this because it thinks that there's more potassium in the cell when in reality the concentration has just gone up. So when that potassium leaves out of the cell to balance, then of course you have hyperkalemia. Now, I said all that to say that that is in a case of hyperglycemia. That means that there's too much glucose. So then think about this, just the opposite. In cases of hyperglycemia, your body combats that by sending insulin out, okay? And insulin, what does insulin do? Insulin will cause these glucose molecules that are all out here in the extracellular space to go back into the cell. Well, now we don't have as much osmolarity and you can just follow the exact pathway. Now there's more water out here, right? So then, because there's more water out here, water goes inside and then the complete reverse thing happens. So that's why insulin causes hypokalemia. Chronic insulin use can cause hypokalemia, especially in cases of patients who have uh, chronic renal failure and stuff like that. Okay, so hypokalemia. Now, I went through the kind of the mechanism of how that works, but really you could just look at the word insulin, look at IN, IN for inside. So potassium moves inside. You can also use that trick for glucose. Glucose will move inside, IN for in, or INS for inside. Okay, so we have covered this, this, the non-potassium sparing diuretics, vomiting diarrhea, diet lacking insulin, now we're moving to beta-2 agonists. So, for beta-2 agonists, also in the previous video on hyperkalemia, I said that a beta-2, so I said that beta-2 agonists, 
basically cause an increased activity of the sodium potassium ATPase. Okay, and the reason is because this is G, what's called GS coupled. It's a specific type of a signal transduction that's G, uh, G protein. It's a G protein signal transducer and it's GS coupled. And there's a whole complica uh, complex pathway for this where you know that there's an increase in CAMP and then you increase the kinases at the end. But what's important to really know is that a beta agonist or the beta receptor uh, drugs here, they increase the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase. So let's go back to our cell. Let's draw a sodium potassium ATPase. I also told you a really uh, corny way to remember how, how you know that sodium's going out and potassium's going in. And I said that on the movie Remember the Titans at the song um, na 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 hey 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 goodbye I said that song is going to basically help you remember so you have na 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 out k k n a t p goodbye the reason a t p goodbye because this cost a t p to run this channel because it's sending an uneven amount of charge it's sending three sodium out and it's sending two potassium in. Can you see how those charges don't balance out? We're actually sending a plus one charge out slowly, which relates to kind of a more negative charge that this will slowly build up inside because of these channels, okay? So just knowing that this beta-2 agonist or beta-2 causing drugs that activate a beta-2 receptor, that it will increase the sodium potassium ATPase, we're now slowly sucking the potassium out of the extracellular space and into the cell. So that's that's why um, the beta-2 agonists cause hypokalemia. Okay, now let's move into the alpha-1 antagonist. There's a, a kind of a more complex mechanism behind this one, but th I just remember it a very simple way because you'll never really get a question asking why this occurs. Just know that this can happen. So in the case of an alpha, before we jump into alpha-1 antagonist, let's talk about, oops, sorry, that was really bad. Alpha, before we talk about alpha-1 antagonist, let's talk about alpha-1 agonist. So alpha-1 acts through what's called a GQ coupled, uh, GQ coupled receptor, which is another form of the G protein coupled receptors. So alpha-1 causes calcium mediated vasoconstriction. So it's you know a more complex pathway of using calcium to cause your vessels to constrict so if this is our vessel eventually then it's going to if you had an, if you pumped it full of the alpha 1 agonist it would constrict up and it would get you know more narrow here and thus raise your blood pressure now this is the way i look at it if you had a cell that's within the vessel and it constricts on that vessel can you imagine that it's smushing that cell and when it smushes that cell, it forces the potassium out of the cell, causing hyperkalemia. Now, I know that's not an accurate actual mechanism, but that's what I used to remember because it gets a little confusing. Beta-2 agonist and alpha-1 antagonist and agonist. So this is how I remember that an alpha-1 agonist, which is calcium-mediated vasoconstriction, right? Calcium-mediated vasoconstriction. That's how I remember that this causes hyperkalemia. Now, now that we know that, well, just the opposite of it. If you're not squeezing it out of the cell, what are you doing now? Well, here's your vessel. We're going to use an alpha-1 antagonist, and it's going to block that effect so the vessel will dilate. Now the, the cell has more room to kind of expand, and it has a little, you know, basically it can get a little large and kind of relax a little bit. So now it has more room for the potassium to be able to be pulled in, and thus, let's say, through those potassium channels, those open potassium channels, and now that will cause um, hypokalemia. Okay, so that's how the alpha-1 antagonists work. And the last one, low magnesium, uh, really complex thing that you don't need to know about how specifically it works. Just know that when you have low magnesium, you are thus causing potassium to be excreted into the urine and be sent out of the body, okay? So in cases of low magnesium, you are also going to have, you can eventually have a situation of low potassium, also called hypokalemia, okay? So that's how the potassium shift works and some various characteristics, and I know there are others, but I wanted to focus on some of the more important ones, okay? So next, the very last thing we're going to talk about is EKG changes. Now, I want to remind you, before we get into the EKG changes for decreased potassium, let's first talk about increased potassium, just in case you missed the last video. So in a case of increased potassium, the primary change is going to be right here at the T wave. And remember, at the T wave, this is going to be the uh, repolarization of the ventricles. Okay. So what you happen is as you increase your potassium levels more and more, this becomes more narrow and it gets higher up and it's what's called tenting.
tenting of the T wave. So it becomes real high and more narrow than it is. And that's a sign of hyperkalemia. And then if it becomes even more serious, you get this tenting that becomes more and more serious and the whole thing begins to get all narrow and closer to each other. And eventually you have what looks like this, what's just called a sinusoidal pattern. That's an even more severe state of hyperkalemia. And then you can tell that this is starting to look really bad. There's sort of no pattern. And eventually you just go into, you know, uh, ventricular fibrillation and then death, okay, if it gets high enough. But now we want to talk about hypokalemia in this video. So for hypokalemia, again, you're going to see some changes at the T wave, but we're also going to see one other thing that, thing that is important to know. So one of the changes you're going to see in the case of hypokalemia is that the T wave will flatten out or it could even invert a little bit. You're basically smashing down on this T wave and it can go way down here or it can just be flattened out. Also, you're gonna have what's called a U wave, a real small U wave. So, you know, we've all heard that this is the P, that's the P wave there, and this is the QRS, right, the QRS, and then this is the T, but there's one called a U that can show up in pathological situations that's usually not noticeable on an EKG. This is called the U wave. All right, and this can show up in cases of hypokalemia, and this is coming right after the T wave. So, in other words, when you look at it on a graph, you know, you'll have your basic setup, and then you'll have something like this. And then that little second thing right there is not the next uh, P wave. That's actually called the U wave. So, you're going to have a U wave, and you're going to have a flattening of the T wave, or you could say, it could even invert in real serious situation. Okay, so that is the video on hypokalemia. If this video helped you all at all, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It's completely free. And also hit the bell next to it so you're notified of when I release more videos. I will see you in another video. See you later.